Welcome everyone. Welcome to the 13th event of our uh, Greece JS meetup. This is the fifth anniversary of these uh, events that we have doing. It was the 14th of April, uh, five years ago, when the first post in the mailing list came out saying that we've got our own domain name, GreaseJS.org. This is where we put all the announcements about talks we give. Um, and in the years that followed, we have augmented that with Meetup, Facebook, Twitter, accounts, and all the rest. This is going to be um, a significant event for us, not just before, because of the anniversary, but also because this is the first time we have a, a speaker from abroad. This is a trend that we plan to continue uh, with the 14th meetup, but we'll talk a little bit more about that in the, uh, in the next few hours. So the, um, the agenda today, we begin uh, with uh, the talk from Max. We'll have um, uh, we'll have a break where we will uh, take out the cake due to the anniversary. Then we we'll have the talks about Benjamin. That will be followed by uh, the lottery picking for the two tickets to the David conference in Thessaloniki uh, next month. And then we'll continue with the rest of the talks. Uh, we wouldn't be here if there weren't for our fabulous sponsors, Innov Athens, who's providing us the space, Workable, and eFood. Um, I, it's uh, a privilege to be associated with them. So, uh, without further ado, let's move on to the presentations. Max Paras is going to be talking to us about modules in JavaScript, so please welcome Max. Thank you. Okay, let's get this presentation on the screen. Cool. So, my name is Max, the rest of the stuff is just extra. Um, I'm a web developer at Agile Actors, and I'm here today to talk to you about why you need to understand modules in JavaScript. Um, well, I mean, not need, but should, you know, it's, it's a good thing. Uh, is, it, is it because this guy here says so? Um, this is Alan Wurst Brock, he's a project editor and author for a bunch of the newer ECMAScript standards. Uh, sorry. Come on. Uh, he said that um, he believes, in his opinion, that JavaScript modules, out of all the specifications, out of all the newer features to the language that we've, been, we've got, that this is uh, the one that's going to impact how we write in the future the most. So. Yeah, we should listen to this guy. He probably knows quite a few things about the language. Um, but in order to, for me to explain to you a bit more, I want to start at the beginning. Um, Brendan Knight wrote JavaScript, the, well, in 10 days. Uh, he was asked to do that for uh, the release of Netscape Navigator 2, I believe. And that came out in May 1995, which is over 21 years ago. Um, that bit of code down there, well, you can't really see it, but that's probably a good thing, because that's HTML and JS from 1996. Funnily enough, it kind of looks like React, and I like React, but anyway. Um, you know, he, when he wrote JavaScript, he wrote it to, you know, just add, he wrote it as a feature for his browser. You know, it was, and it was, it was to add a little interactivity to what was primarily a document-based um, experience. So it wasn't designed to do anything crazy. It wasn't designed to do the things that we do with, to it today. And yet, you know, that, that code right there was written in 1996, a year after JavaScript's release. 
the array data type hadn't been uh, included in the language at this point, I think. So it's, it's interesting, you know, like, people were using it already. And people kept on using it, and they started using it, and nowadays people are using it, you know, from your uncle's website to on the server, to the crazy Internet of Things stuff that Benjamin's going to show us. You know, JavaScript is everywhere. Uh, yeah, you can't read that, but that says Kevin Laker, uh, co-founder and CTO of Parse. Uh, he said this JavaScript is eating the world, which was based off of someone else's saying, Mark Andreessen, who said software is eating the world. And yeah, we're trying to put JavaScript everywhere. But in order to put JavaScript everywhere, you needed to be able to write it, you know, more than just like as a scripting language. You, need, you needed it to be more of a, a programming base that you could do professional things with. And one of the things, there were, there were different issues and a lot of features that were added to the language, solved those issues, but the ones I'm gonna focus on today are about modules. So the problems of Java, the JavaScript had, and until very recently has, uh, without modules is that for one, um, everything's in the global scope by default. You know, if you're just writing a script and you write a function or you write a variable, you know, that's by default automatically in the global scope. And if you keep writing like this, if you're in a bigger team and you're all writing like this and you're taking in third party code and they're writing like that, it gets crazy. You, how, how do you know, you know what variable are you going to use? How, how many times are you going to run into this issue that you're, you know, you're, you're clashing with some other third party library because of using the same verb for a function? So that was one issue. Um, this leads into maintainability because another thing that JavaScript couldn't do by itself uh, or, and didn't have uh, the support in the platforms, like the browser, to help it do was you couldn't break it up easily. You couldn't. Um, it, it wasn't performant to break up your JavaScript code and include a bunch of scripts out. So you were kind of forced to write in these big, huge JavaScript files. And I remember, probably three years ago, I was writing in you know a script JS file with over three thousand lines, and yeah, I was organized. It had. Uh, little titles and comments every 200 lines or so saying, you know, this is a slider right here and this, this bit here is a tabs uh, widget. So, yeah, it was organized, but it was, it was difficult to work with. And whenever, you know, you introduce more people to this, whenever you introduce more code to this uh, equation, it, it only gets worse. Reusability. Because of what I've been talking about, when you go into this into these projects, you couldn't easily break out code and take it over to another project. It was essentially copy paste. Um, things weren't encapsulated. They weren't they weren't single purpose. They weren't easy to just pick up from this project, put in the other project. And if these problems weren't solved in JavaScript. The things that we have today using the language wouldn't exist. Uh, it's kind of famous, I don't know, that sort of a, a classic example that says that Gmail has several hundred thousand lines of JavaScript code for the experience that it has. Now, I was having difficulty with 3,000 lines. Um, things like Gmail would not exist, I would say, if these problems weren't solved. But, you know, um, we're hackers, so we're, we're gonna try and, we're gonna try and find a solution. Uh, by the way, I'm gonna upload the slides, we're gonna share them on the uh, Meetup site, so, you know, if you can't read the code right now, I do apologize, um, but you're gonna have access to it. Essentially, this bit of code, this tiny bit of code, is supposed to be like before JavaScript, uh, before modules. 
um, all of this is in the global scope. You have a count variable, you have an update function, and two click handlers to increment and decrement the number. It's just a simple counter. Um, but yeah, now I've written this in my gigantic file. I can't have another update function. You know, if I if somewhere else someone else writes another update function or writes another count variable, that might mess up these callbacks right here. You know, they might, might break the functionality. And the, every person who's writing needs to know every little bit of code that, that exists in this giant file. That just doesn't scale. And, you know, the other thing, let's say we have a slider somewhere else uh, in this project, and it, it depends on this, on this little counter. Do we, you know, we might just use the count variable right there to, to set how many slides we're going to show. This, this dependency, we, we don't know about it. You know, you have to really know the entire code base. You know, you can't go in and change that easily. You don't know if some other function is using that update or some other module is using that count. This code is naked. And that's not cool. By the way, that's what I look like when I look at my own code, so. Anyway, um, so how did we solve uh, this problem? Well, we figured out pretty quickly, or not so quickly, I don't know, that we could just wrap this bit of code inside a closure, JavaScript closure. Now suddenly the scope of this, all of these variables right here, is the function scope. You can see this function expression is wrapping this bit of code that we had before. It's returning the public parts of the code that we know these parts are going to be used, can be used somewhere else. So we're going to be more careful when we're changing this. But now we can change whatever we want in here in terms of, you know, adding stuff, removing stuff, and so long as the functionality is the same, I suppose. And this is the module symptom, singleton. This is the basis of all the modern implementations. I mean, they started from this. Even the ES6 stuff, you know, it's got its roots in this, in this simple thing, this simple step that we took from just plain code to wrapped code in a, in a, in a function expression. The one bit that this, doesn't, this code doesn't solve so well is dependencies. Um, the code that we saw, you know, we, told, we talked about the slider, it's still not easy to know um, that the slider is dependent on that counter, that counter uh, module. So when we're putting our final file together using a concatenation method, we really need to know this, this stuff beforehand in order to know in which order we need to put things if we're going to just write it in that simple way I showed before. You know, with dependencies, ordering is important. And dependencies need to be obvious so that you can put them together and, uh, and make them work. So we started out with this. And what we did, the next step that we did is we added the, we passed in this, this global identifier of the counter of the counter um, module into the slider module. So now when we open the slider module, we can immediately see that the slider depends on this counter. Where is this counter? This counter is here, wherever that is. So at least we, we open up this, this file, we can easily see the, um, what it depends on. We don't have to dig into the middle of the code because you know there might be loads of code in slider and this counter get count might be buried in there. But that doesn't solve things like, you know, it doesn't make it easy. We still have to take this and manually put our dependencies in order. And, you know, it doesn't solve harder problems like uh, dependency, uh, circular dependencies and things like that. So we took this as an idea and we, we, we took it a step further. And this is really... I mean, it would work in a really simple way. It doesn't uh, solve the 
a circular dependencies issue, but you know, it's, it's a beginning. We, let, let's say we, we'll create this require function here. And this require function um, will take an ID. And what's that ID? Well, when we're defining each module, we're going to define it with as a key, uh, as a value to the key on the module's um, global. And then the require function is going to look at that module's global, see if that key exists, and if it doesn't exist, initialize the module and give it back to us. And so now, all we have to do in our main file, in our final file, it doesn't matter which order we put this stuff in, um, we just put it in, it all gets registered, and then right at the end we kick it off somehow. You know, we, we there's this one file, this one uh, module, that, or entry file as they're usually called, that sort of kicks this whole thing off and, and um, uh, starts running the entire app, starts loading each module, starts loading in the, the next module that it needs, the next dependency that it needs. But I did say that this was simple, you know, and there are harder problems hidden behind this. And so a lot of people started working on this. And we got things like CommonJS. CommonJS was the first one. It's got a require function as well. That's my face line on. Uh, CommonJS as a project was started by Kevin Dangur in uh, 2009. And it was, he was a Mozilla engineer. And he, and it was uh, supposed to be a standard library for JavaScript. Uh, the CommonJS modules part of that library is probably the most famous, at uh, least for me, maybe, I'm, maybe other people know it, uh, part of the library. Um, and it was picked up by Node.js. Node.js used this when it started out and I think popularized it. And one of the reasons Node.js picked this was because it was designed for servers. Now this leads on to the next bit, which is AMD. Now, some people, uh, James Burke, uh, well, initially James Burke, uh, you know, he, he realized that, you know, the CommonJS way of doing things didn't really work well in browsers at the time. Didn't have bundlers and things like that that would handle that for you. And so he came up with a synchronous module definition, or AMD, the AMD way of doing it. And, uh, he implemented it in a library called require.js and actually AMD was uh, in combination, James worked in combination with Chris Sid came up with this. So it was designed and it was picked up by a lot of front-end libraries like jQuery and others. So this one became popular, probably more popular uh, in the beginning because you could use it in the browser, at least for front-end developers. But because of the node um, the momentum that Node was gaining, and because especially of the momentum that NPM was gaining, CommonJS was also um, being used more and more. And so we needed a way that we could write our uh, libraries, our modules, our third-party code mostly, uh, so that it worked in every single situation. And that was UMD, Universal Module Definition, you don't have to read this. This isn't really important. This, you know, gobbledygook there. It just does that and that and globals as well. So if that doesn't work, it tries this. Or, and if that doesn't work, it'll try a global. And so you get the best of all worlds. And for a long time, this was how you do it. But like I said, you don't want to know what that is. You don't want to write this for every module that you're going to write. So we started building tools to help us do that. And yay, tool fatigue. But I think tools are cool. Um, Require.js uh, was, like I said, one of the first tools. Uh, it worked only for AMD, uh, at least most of the time. And, um, but we wanted, we wanted this, this UMD stuff. We wanted, we wanted it to write it once and it would work everywhere. And so we got, you know, these cool guys, or these projects. Browser Verifier and Webpack. And they, 
you know, you'd write your files, you use AMD, you use OpenJS, they take it, they put it in UMD, they put it in whatever you want. Essentially, they, they take your files and they do a lot of clever things. They, you know, they read the files, static analysis, they figure things out about the code, they make optimizations. You know, it really opened up a new world. Now that we had tools that were in our uh, build process to, to give us things that we wanted, we could use them, start using them to do more things. So, having these modules, needing, needing these modules led to having these tools uh, proliferate and give us things like CSS loaders because and image loaders and anything loaders because you now now that you were just transforming code reading code transforming it and putting it doing something with it you had you could you could read any code you could read any file transform it into a function what is a CSS loader it takes a, a bit of CSS um, and let's say it puts it this is like a fake one, but whatever. It puts it in a function, a JavaScript function, that will load that CSS onto the page. That, that could be a really simple CSS loader. Just print out uh, the document append that CSS onto the page that we're interested in. Um, you know, so, so you suddenly had these superpowers. You could do things like, you know, transpilation and linting. Module sort of the need for modules led to Browserify and Webpack, and then led to, you know, the acceptance, because I'm sure this stuff would have come out anyway, and you know, you can use the tool standalone, of course, um, of things like transpiling your code, uh, of things like putting in linting, and making sure that, you know, all the whole team was writing the same code. Um, you got other things, you got chunking, you could now, load some modules on some pages and some modules on other pages and sort of organize your code to be as optimal as you wanted it. And that was made possible and simpler using these tools. And you've got pop module replacement, which is, I'm not going to go into it much, but it essentially it's supposed to let you edit live code. So you can have code running in the browser um, and you make a change to it, you know, because you're developing. And you'll see a JavaScript function that did one thing the minute before. Now you've changed it. Same running browser without a refresh. It'll do another thing. Um, Dan Abramov has a, a great talk on that um, that I'm going to link up when I put this uh, slideshow online. But anyway, during all of this, uh, the people behind JavaScript, the language, were taking note. And what they came up with was ES2000, ES6, ES2015 modules. And I've put them side by side with the CommonJS modules are on the left, and ES6 modules are on the right, just so you can see the similarities that they have. Now, mostly they work the same way. Um, they do have differences. And the interesting thing is, and uh, this is a even more, this is a quite recent development, or at least I'm hearing it recently, um, is that, you know, finally this stuff, they're figuring out how to make this stuff work natively in browsers. Because until now, they released the specification, they released it how it was supposed to work, but it didn't really work in the browser. But soon it's going to work in the browser. And when it does, modules on the right, for one, they're going to be in strict mode. Strict mode is a mode in JavaScript that uh, doesn't let you write uh, specific keywords like with and things like that, and um, doesn't let you use the global scope. And well, the next thing is anyway, the top level scope of a module file, not, not true for a script file that we have, Right now, where everything we write is counted as a script file. But a module file, the top level scope is not the global scope anymore. It's the module scope. It's the scope of that file. So we can just write in there without wrapping in a function anymore. Finally, you know, we don't have to do boilerplate to write our code. 
And instead of using require, you use import, like you can see here, well, or you can't see, but you will see when you look at the slides online. And you use export, export um, to um, show which parts of your code here inside the module are sort of public or available if someone else imports your module. So that's, that's what we're doing, that's what's happening now, right now. Uh, but what's next? Uh, we, come on. Um, well, for me, for one, we've seen all these module formats. You know, a lot of work has gone into them. They're very clever in the things that they do do, and they do the things that they were designed to do mostly very well. Um, but since we have ES 2015 modules, they're based off of these, this work that has been done, and they're gonna be natively supported. My suggestion is, from here on out, if you're gonna use modules, try and use this. If you're in an old code base, fine, you know. But there are gonna be a lot of benefits to this. One of the benefits, um, code optimization tools that have come out recently that work with the module specification and the sort of rules that it has, like, there's a library called Rollup.js that popularized the term tree shaking, uh, which essentially is a minification technique where you only include the methods, the functions, the um, code that is actually being used in the application. And um, it's different from dead code elimination in the approach that it takes. I'm not gonna go into the details of this, but um, if people are interested, you know, I, I can share links. Um, and the final thing is, yeah, the implementation is coming to browsers. You're soon going to be able to write this thing here, script type module. Right now, the default was script type script, I think. Um, and, or JavaScript. And, um, uh, yeah, and this writing inside here, you can do import, you can do export. Uh, it had all the properties that I discussed in the previous slide. You know, the scope wasn't global. So, you know, this is coming to browsers soon. And um, that's it. Thank you. Right, so now we'll have questions. Raise your hand and I'll bring the microphone to you. Okay, so I have one for ah. Stop. Uh, more of an observation than a question. It's, uh, you, you said at some point that uh, we should use uh, uh, ESX, pro, uh, ESX modules and uh, if we're, if we're uh, in, in an old code base, okay, it's fine. Uh, what I want to say is that if you, constant, if you constantly strive uh, to keep up to date, even if you're in a, in a non code base, you can still uh, gradually introduce ESX modules into an old code base. I mean, uh, it's doable, we've done it, and it was uh, really hard, but uh, proved the uh, best choice. Okay. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that. Um, when you do use it, um, do have in mind a strategy um, to, if you're using the old methods, to move to the new methods. So yeah, I definitely agree. Thanks. Anyone else? So that's my first meetup actually. So my question focuses more on JavaScript as a programming language and less on modules. Uh, I'm a C++ developer. Uh, my first programming language was C 
and I have a big experience with pointers and such. Uh, and I'm wondering where are pointers and uh, memory allocations tools on uh, on JavaScript and web languages in general. Um, it might be a basic question, but yeah. It might be basic and I might not be qualified to answer it. Um, I'm going to say that uh, JavaScript is a um, garbage collected language, so I don't know that you do deal with um, pointers and memory allocation and things like that too much. Um, I mean, uh, um, that, that's what I mean. Maybe I'm talking bullshit. The computer that uh, views a website doesn't, or a web app, uh, doesn't uh, need to allocate memory and uh, you don't need to manage the memory of the computer that views your app. Uh, the server runs the app, has memory, and somehow you need to be... Uh, how to pronounce it? Uh, more like oh, what, efficient the on the server's memory. I'm gonna say... I'm gonna say again. Um, I don't know if anyone else is, feels more qualified to answer. I'm going to answer. Was there someone? You want? Okay, I'm going to say uh, JavaScript runs in the virtual machine. Um, so that deals with handling um, the memory allocations. Is that correct? I think so. Um, so when you're writing JavaScript, do you want to jump in? Memories who can also have access to registers if they are memory mapped. And we do use these languages when we do need to have this access to build higher level languages that are application level languages like Java or JavaScript. Where there we run our code in a managed context. It means that we do have memory management and garbage collection. So everything actually is a pointer but we do not see it through the row as we do in C++, but we are protected from that. So actually we have access to the memory through a pointer that we never see, and we never have to do any need for something we allocate it through a new, as we do in C++ for JavaScript. So this is managed from, from, for us, and we are safe because we cannot write anywhere in uh, the memory as we do in C or C++. And uh, I don't know if this answers the question. I think it does. We can uh, continue later on that discussion. <laughs> Anyone else? <coughs> Hello. Uh, when you were talking about CSS imports of uh, small snippets of code of CSS, uh, on a perspective of uh, SEO or server optimization, those those. Uh, how does that work? Those uh, imports uh, will, seem, um, will mean different server requests or it's some more on a DOM level, okay. like uh, inline HTML? Okay. Um, I gave a sort of toy example uh, when I was talking about CSS, uh, using CSS loaders and things like that. The loaders that are included in Browser Airfy and Webpack, they're a lot smarter. So essentially, you can import a lot of CSS files in a lot of different modules in your JavaScript code. And the loader will then pick up all these things, if you configure it to do so, pick them all up, merge them into one file, and then give you that one file. So like I said, they, they figured it out in terms of that. It's it's, it's managed for you, and that's another part of why it's pretty cool. My, my doubt is exactly uh, on what you said. Does the, that merging process of uh, several snippets of CSS code into one file will not uh, mean a higher server load? Okay, so... In turn, prejudice... Uh, fair, fair question. The, the merging doesn't happen per request. So it doesn't happen when you ask to the browse to the site. The merging happens during development. So 
while you're writing your CSS code, you're going to run one more step before you send your site to the server. You know, when you finish your fixing, building your website, you're going to press this whatever run webpack or run browserify, and it's going to compile or it's going to build out your final uh, website's files. And then you're going to just put that in your server like you normally would. So it doesn't happen every time someone goes to your site. It happens only when you do it once, you know, while you're writing it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, discussion around, you know, the thing that happened with the NPM uh, registry. So th there was there was a problem with the NPM registry, not a problem actually. Uh, um, a company wanted a name that was already taken from another module. So they they went to the maintainers of the NPM registry, they requested the, the module, and they gave it actually to the companies. That they, they took it from the person that had it. So there's a lot of discussion around um, adding all the dependencies in the source code and shipping them with the module instead of requiring them from npm. Do you understand the question? Yeah, yeah I understand the question. Um, there's a lot of drama surrounding this, this issue um, and it's a valid issue though. So uh, yeah, the story was that a, a guy who had a lot of npm modules and npm is a package manager for JavaScript um, you write some code that you think is a good module that people are going to use and you publish it to NPM and then other people can start using it, start downloading it and using it in their code. And uh, when they do that, most of the time they just, every time they install the application, if they're going to develop it locally, if they're going to publish it to the server, they download that same uh, code from NPM again. Uh, and that was the issue because this guy he got mad and he pulled every single one of his packages down and this is something that was criticized of NPM NPM because JavaScript is new NPM is new they tried some different things to make it to lower the bar for people uh, to contribute to the JavaScript community and one of the ways they did that was that they said fine if you want to un uh, unpublish something, you know, uh, we give you the power to unpublish something. So this guy did, he had, I can't remember the number, but it was lots, it's over a hundred modules that he had up there, and he unpublished every single one of them. And um, that, it, funnily enough, it was one tiny module that he had, which affected the greater ecosystem, because another popular project, uh, was using this one module. And so, all these people that I told you about before, that download stuff from NPM to run it on their servers, to run it in their build process, suddenly, their code wasn't running because NPM was like, sorry, that bit of code that you were using doesn't exist anymore. Um, so yeah, your question was whether... What, what's your take? Uh, what the, so there's a lot of discussion around um, including the dependencies within the source code you see, like you do uh, with the web browser. Then and there's a lot of discussion around doing that for the NPM uh, modules as well. So what's your take on that? Yeah, um, my opinion is that that sounds like a good idea. Um, one of the interesting things is that this got fixed pretty quickly. The downtime was only a couple of hours that people couldn't run their code because NPM didn't have, because NPM stepped in and fixed this, at least for this um, specific package. And I think they also removed the ability to unpublish. Um, so that exact scenario won't happen again. But to protect yourself from other scenarios like this that we don't know about yet because they haven't happened, yeah, it's probably good when you're going to go live with someone, when you're going to, you know, make the commitment that this thing is up there and it's going to be running, you know, it's important that you have all the code uh, locally, that you have it downloaded somewhere, that you can use it. Did you mean to 
write that bit of code if you were if if it was a small no, no, that was the argument as well. So you just raising the dependencies within the user search code. Okay, so yeah, that, yeah. But I think you answered okay. the question. Yeah. yeah. So thank you. Many thanks to Max. You're okay. <laughs>